In this video I'm going to take a look at namespaces and naming conflicts that can occur when you use tkinter. You will note that for all the Python tkinter programs I have used so far in this playlist I've started the code with the following line. From tkinter import and then you can see there's an asterisk which means import everything. Now it's okay to use this for small personal scripts or short teaching scripts but you should not use this for any large programs or any commercial programs as it risks causing naming conflicts. Before I move on to show an example of a naming conflict I'd like to take a side step and look at what are called namespaces in Python. Namespaces are mappings from names to actual objects. Consider the following program statement. You can see I'm saying var underscore name is assigned 7. Now what this will do, it'll create an instance of the integer class and that instance will have the value of 7 as you can see by the schematic animation. And this object, which is an instance of the integer class, will be known within the program by var underscore name, which we can regard as a label. So if I wanted to get at this 7, to read it for example, to find out what's in this object that's labeled with this, I have to go via the label. So conceptually a label is given to the integer object that has the value of 7. So when we talk about variables in Python, what we need to realize is everything in Python is an object. So this program statement ends up being an integer object that has the value of 7 that's labeled by the identifier var underscore name as you can see in the schematic representation here. In Python every module, class and function have their own namespace. This is effectively where variables live. You can think of it as being an area where all of the variables live, where all of the labels live that points to everything that we have within our Python program. Because remember, in Python you'll often heard it said everything is an object. So a function, for example, is an object in the same way as we saw a moment ago that we have a variable being an instance of the integer class, i.e. an object. Functions can also be regarded as objects. Let's consider the following computer program and you can see it's a program that has a function and four program statements. Now I'm going to look at the runtime for this and I'm going to do a trace of this program now and see what actually happens. Well the first thing that we can say is this is going to execute first. Var underscore name is assigned 1. Now that's going to create an instance of the integer class and that instance is going to have the value 1 and it's going to be labeled with this. And what this line is doing, it's going to print var underscore name outside the function as a string which it puts here and this gains access to the value of the integer which we can see on this line was set to 1 so it displays 1 here. This line will now call the function that was defined here and the first line of this function this here is saying var underscore name is assigned 5. Now what this is going to do it's going to create an instance of an integer class and it's going to give that the value of 5 and it's going to be labeled with this and when we come on to this line what this is doing it's telling us that var underscore name in the function i.e. it's referring to this is and here you can see what outputting that value. So when we consider this line and what its output is, we can see its output here. Var name in the function is 5. So in other words, we can say that this was assigned 5. Now if we stop at this point and consider what we have, this is var name and this is var name here. They're the same label or so that would appear and we'll see in a moment that in fact this line and this line produce different instances of the integer class. 
Of course, when this line finishes executing, the function finishes executing, so we return to this area of the program and we execute this line. And what this is doing, it's outputting the string here, var name outside the function is, which it places here, and this var underscore name is the value that we can see output here. And it's quite obvious that nothing has happened to this variable when we called this function. This is the same program that I've just been discussing. We looked at its runtime. Let's have a look at it again. And what we can see, we have a program that has effectively two areas. We have this area here, and this area is the main part of the program. And this is the function part that's called from here. So when I look at this piece of code, I know that this is the main area, if you like, of the code. This is the global area, and this is a function that's called from the global area. Area. A useful schematic diagram to show the concepts behind this notion of a global area and an area for the function can be shown here. And what you can see, we have what's termed a global namespace, which is this area, and we have a function namespace, which is this area here. Now I'm going to do a run through this program and we're going to see that this line executes first. And what's going to happen when this executes is we're going to have an instance of the integer class created that has the value of 1. And that's going to appear in the global namespace as you can see here. This is the object and that's the value the object has. Now, if we consider the statement, the program statement in full, you can see we have var underscore name here. And if we remember, that's the label that labels the object that's been created. So I'm showing that label here. Of course, the next program statement to execute is this, and we've already seen what that will do. It outputs this string, and this will output the value of this named variable here, which is this label referencing this object, so one is output. Then we go on to this program statement, which causes this function to execute, and then we execute this line here. And what this will do is, as shown in the schematic diagram, it will produce an instance of the integer class, which has the value of 5, as you can see, because this 5, you can see, appears here in the code. And, of course, if we look here, we can see var underscore name is the label that's going to identify this object. So I can show that as here. Now, what we can see is we have these two objects which are independent of each other, and they both have the same identifier. They both are labelled with the same var underscore name. However, this object is in the global namespace, and this object is in the function namespace. So Python is able to distinguish between these two objects, even though they have the same name, because they're in different namespaces. And conceptually, you can think of this as a chain in which all the objects appear. And this is a chain in which all of the object appears. This tin holds all of the objects that were created in the global area of the program. And this one holds all of the objects that are declared in this function. But of course, there's only one declared. That's why we see one here. Let's now consider the runtime of this program, as you can see here, and we'll trace the program. This is the first line to execute, and what it will do, it will produce the instance of the integer class that has the label var underscore name, as shown here. And you can see that that instance is being produced in the global namespace. So when we come onto this line, we can see this is going to print this string here and of course then we have this which is the identifier of the integer object and of course that I'm showing here as the label which identifies this and of course because this line appears in this global area I know that Python's going to go to this object because it's in the global namespace consequently this one is displayed here this line is now executed, which is a call to this function, and the first line of the function is this. And what this will do, it'll create an instance of the integer class, where that instance will have the value 5, and it'll be labelled with this name, as you can see here. But what we also need to observe is that this instance of the integer class appears in the function namespace. 
So when I come onto this line, we will print this string here. And of course, we then use this, which is this label addressing this instance. And of course, we can see this instance has five. So five gets displayed here. Then we return from the function to this line. And of course, what it will do, it'll output this string here. And this name is now the name of this object because we're in the global namespace. Consequently, the one is output here. Let's consider the program and let's consider the key features of it. Well, I like to think of the following. If I look at var underscore name equals one, i.e. this line, I like to think of that living in the global namespace. If I now consider this program statement, which is the one shown here within the function, I like to think of that as living in the function namespace. So in other words, this variable name lives in the global namespace, and this variable name lives in the function namespace. And they're separated from each other by this idea of different areas within the code. This compartmentalization ensures that the global var name cannot be overridden what looks like the same statement that lives in the function namespace. In other words, this program statement which resides within the function does not alter this variable here, even though this and this have the same name. They do have the same name, they do have a label that has the same identifier, but of course they live in different spaces. Think of it this way, you've got two tutorial groups, tutorial group A and tutorial group B, and you have two students called Fred Blogs. One's in tutorial group A and one's in tutorial group B, and they share the lecture and the tutorial follows on from the lecture. And you want to contact one of them, and you know which one it is, and you know what tutorial group they're in. So what you say, you say, can I see Fred Blogs, please, from tutorial group A? That means the one in tutorial group A, i.e. Fred Blogs, knows to come and see you, and the other one who's heard his own name shouted realises he's the one in tutorial group B, so he doesn't come and see you. In Python, every module, class, and function have their own namespace, their own area. And we've seen with tkinter an example of importing a module, which is shown here. We looked at this right at the beginning of this video. Now, if we decide to do this, what we're doing, we're loading all of the tkinter names, i.e. the labels. And by labels, by the way, I don't mean the labels that you see on a window or on a frame within tkinter. I'm talking about the conceptual label that labels the instances of classes. So if you create a variable function or a class within the global namespace that has its name identical to a TK inter name, then you will get a name conflict. This will result in your program not being able to use the name defined in TK inter. Instead, it will use the one you have coded in the global namespace. Let's consider this program, which is one we've seen in a previous video, and we're using this to import tkinter. We're importing everything from tkinter. This creates an instance of a window, and this line creates an instance of the canvas class that's associated with the window, and it has the width of 200 and the height of 200, and its background color is blue. And then this will add the canvas using the grid method at row zero, column zero, and of course we go into the main loop. Now when this program executes, what we're going to get is this. This is the window that was created on this line. This is the canvas that was created here and positioned at row zero, column zero, and you can see it's 200 by 200 and its background is blue. Now this is a short program, there's no issues with this, I know I'm only practicing to show people how canvases can be placed on windows, so I'm knock this up with this here. But of course, if there were many lines of code, we could have problems if I forget what's in TK Inter and I decide to use a function and give it a name that's the same as the name in TK Inter. And that's what I'm going to do on the next slide and show you what happens. Now this is the program we've just looked at with this 
addition here I've defined a function that has the name canvas and if you have a look at the function it doesn't take any parameters and there's no content to the function I've just got the pass command there and of course I could fill this in with appropriate code but this is just a dummy function that's designed to show you what happens when this program runs so just to repeat we have a function here that doesn't do anything but it's syntactically correct and I've got this here passed and if you remember from an earlier video I said you often do this you produce a function you put the word pass in there and you fill the code in later when you've got time because you'll be writing your functions in a particular order now when this program executes the output you're going to see is the following you get an error and the error is shown really on this line and it says canvas got an unexpected keyword argument width now what's happened here you're attempting to produce a canvas on this line and when you have look at that it's something you've done many times before and all of a sudden you're getting an error and it can be extremely baffling what in fact has happened is you have accidentally produced this function with a name that appears in here so when you attempt to do this Python has to make a decision what's it going to do is it going to look in here or is it going to go to this well it goes to this and if you have a look at this it's a function as I've said doesn't do anything and if you have a look in here in the brackets there are no parameters it is expecting but if you look here you can see there's loads of parameters and these parameters are attempting to pass to here and of course Python says well I've got nothing to receive these parameters so it comes down here and says got an unexpected keyword argument width which is this one here so it gives you an error as you can see on this line now what's happened is you've got a name conflict you've declared here a function which is in the global space and it means that Python now uses that one when you produce this line instead of the one that's been imported from TK into it's an example of a name conflict of course for a small program like this this is pretty easy to spot you know I'm using canvas and here I've declared something called canvas oh blimey I better change the name of that to something more sensible and by that I mean something that won't cause a naming conflict now the trouble is I've spotted it easily because this program is not got many lines but if you imagine you've got a program with hundreds of and thousands of lines it's often very difficult to twig what's going on because you don't spot this right in front of you when you're reading it it's somewhere higher up the program listing so you sit there for quite a time sometimes looking at this and going why is this not working I've done this so many times this is correct why is it saying it's got an unexpected keyword width I've used this width many times in the past well it's because you have got a naming conflict created by you or another programmer in your team putting this in here now I said you can correct this by changing the name of this in truth a far better thing to do is to change the way in which you import TK Inter. now I'm not going to do that in this video but what I am going to do once I've explained what namespaces are in a bit more detail I will come back to looking at what this should be replaced by when you're writing TK into programs so the next programs that are coming up are going to be looking at namespaces in a little bit more detail now you may be thinking well I don't want to know about namespaces just show me more TK into but it's such an important feature when you're importing modules that you understand what a namespace is so you can avoid having an error where you spend a good half hour to me be a full morning banging your head against the wall because you're thinking why is this not working check out the supporting website for these videos in addition why not follow me on Twitter as I issue a tweet every time I upload a new video